Well, I mean, it, in, the, in the early part of the century, America had what one scholar called sort of a one best system approach to education. There was one model. It was a primarily Anglo model. It was an English-speaking Protestant model. And basically, everybody had to fit into that system. Mm -hmm. I don't think that anybody is arguing here that we need to go back to the one best system approach to mm -hmm. education. We have gone past that. There's no question about it. We are a multicultural society. We believe that we have to honor and value the cultures of a whole variety of different peoples, both that live here and that are raised here and that come here from other shores. So this is, we're not advocating a one best system approach by any stretch of the imagination. And in fact, that one, system, one best system approach, we have a whole lot of evidence that says that it, it just didn't work. A lot of immigrants succeeded, but oftentimes they succeeded despite the educational right. system and not yeah. because of it. What we're simply saying, and I think it's basically, I go back to the basic intuitive, which is if I want to teach a kid math, I should, I should offer hours of instruction in math. If I want to teach a kid uh, science, I should offer hours of instruction in science. And so too, if I want to teach a kid English, to offer them hours of instruction in Spanish doesn't seem to make much sense. I should teach them English. Well, I don't think we disagree about that. I mean, I think w one of the problems with this initiative, with what's going on here in California, is that it is, it will become the law of this state, that it will be impossible to change. You know, initiatives like Proposition 13 changed which California, was the tax which was the property tax initiative, s destroyed the school system here in California. And we had a wonderful school system. We were the tops in the n country here in California. Proposition 13 changed all that. This initiative, this one-year English language immersion of 180 days, will be there permanently. It could not be changed because it will be a constitutional amendment, it's and it will mean amendment. that two-thirds of the legislature. It's not a constitutional amendment. It just requires a supermajority from the legislature. From the to legislature overturn. to change it, right. and it also means the governor would have to sign it. It never happens. It will not be changed. It is an untested measure. Bilingual education needs to be reformed, but this is not a way to do it. Nobody knows whether this one-year immersion program will work. And, and where it has been tried, this one-year immersion program has been tried in Westminster School District here in Orange County. That's near Los Angeles for the people out of state. Where it was tried, it failed. They had to petition the State Board of Education to get more time. They needed more time because the children did not learn English in one year. And you know, one of the things that you said, talking about learning another language, I remember as a young girl in Hebrew school, I remember trying to learn the Hebrew alphabet. And I remember that A daunting I was, task. Yes, a very daunting task. And to this day, I still know the regular one. I don't know cursive yet. But anyway, someday I'll, I'll learn that. But it, it, it was so helpful to have someone who could tell me Aleph means A, because I knew what A meant. And another thing that's going to happen with Prop two, two, Proposition 227 is that these children, they're going to fall behind in every other subject. They're and we don't know that, do we? Yes, we do. How? We, we do not know. They're how do we know that? We know that. How do we know it? How do we it know it, says it right in the No, no, no. How do we know that they're going to fall behind? Because they'll be taught English for 180 days. They're going to mix up five-year-olds So it's a syllogism from your perspective. If A, then B, always. No, no. It's not a syllogism. They're going to be taught English for one year. Right. Now, there are other subjects they're not going no, to be taught. You continue with math and you continue with it, science. Well, Our actually, it doesn't say that in the initiative. That's what English And all we can go by is what's in the initiative so, and they say they're so it strikes mix me that one of the things that's going to happen out of this may be good for California separate apart from the issue of bilingual education which is the whole discussion of the initiative process um, having nothing to do with the merits of this particular initiative um, but the fact that the that the conversation um, now focuses around what is read between the lines and what is on the lines mm -hmm. of this particular initiative and the issue of the supermajority and how a legislature would undo the act of the people should it wish to and and maybe rethinking public policy mm -hmm. uh, by initiative. Yes. But actually, exactly. I, I think that and that's a very good idea. But I'd like to go back to what Holly said about how she learned Hebrew because I think that's really a case in point. Now, Holly, do you speak Hebrew today? I do speak some, but not. But, but I, I do, do you consider yourself to be really proficient from your Hebrew school education? 
Um, I didn't. I didn't study Hebrew. Okay, because for the most part, I think that the, 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 the most of our viewing audience, I think, that attended Hebrew schools would probably say that they're not especially proficient. Forget but Hebrew school. <laughs> Anybody who took an academic second language but didn't speak it regularly is probably not proficient. But, uh, but let's. I mean, I, I took French in high school. Okay. Now I, I would say that I learned a lot more French in high school than I learned Hebrew, and I, I went to Hebrew school as well. But the point is, I took French, and my teacher spoke to me in French. Right. She used French as the language of instruction. I took Hebrew in Hebrew school, and my, my Hebrew school teacher spoke to me in English and tried to teach me Hebrew. When well, she that's wasn't trying to grab the paper airplanes <laughs> out of the that's hand. Right. <laughs> 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 that's right. Yeah, that's what happened. Okay, okay but the point is, <laughs> that, uh, what I'm trying to suggest, in fact, that, that your example it, it, it proves, proves the opposite of the case. Because, in fact, we have not applied an American supplemental, that is, an American synagogue education in our Hebrew schools. We have not applied what we know about second language acquisition. What we know about second language acquisition is that you have to put a youngster in an immersion experience in order to be able to acquire the language. And in fact, the best way to explain a person to a young person, Aleph, if you want them to know Hebrew, is not to tell them that Aleph is A, because in fact, Aleph is not A. Aleph is a silent letter. So you have to explain to them in Hebrew what Aleph is so that they can understand what it is in the context of that language. And that actually is what we know about second you know, language acquisition I, all the way across I the board. I think this brings up a really good point, which <coughs> is that every child learns different. And for me, that worked in Hebrew school. And I did learn Hebrew that way. And I think that that's what we're saying, that Proposition 227, that is a one-size-fits-all program that takes, now the State Board of Education here in California just recently decided to let local school districts have the flexibility to decide how best to teach children English. Now, Proposition 227 will take all of that away, will mandate one program that, as Ramona said, cannot be changed except by a two-thirds vote of the legislature, governor's signature, or by another initiative. And there aren't many wealthy millionaires like Ron Unz, who, you know, admits he's never stepped foot into a bilingual education classroom that can put something on the ballot like this. Yeah, but to, to, say that, to say that, that, that uh, all children learn differently is, is to say that no, we can learn nothing from research about the way in which people acquire language. Right. We do know from a huge body of research that the vast majority of children learn, acquire language, any language, better in an immersion experience. And that's just basically and, intuitive. And, and it's a fundamental time-on-task idea. If you're in a place where they use the language, you're going to be more likely to acquire it. Right. And, and, that's to, same and to, let me just finish oh, this sorry. point. And to say that a person learns differently, is not that, that means in the context of an immersion experience, I'm going to need to address one child through a variety of visual apparatuses and another child through a variety of verbal apparatuses. Some of them are going to learn better orally, mm -hmm. some of them are going to learn a little faster, some of them a little slower. But the fundamental proposition that if I want to teach Hebrew, I should use Hebrew, or if I want to teach Spanish, I should use Spanish, I think that the research is pretty clear that in the vast majority of cases, that's simply the best way to teach it. Ramona, yes. if, if you were to... Um to be able to make a compelling one sentence um, argument to people about what's the, what is fundamentally wrong with, with this approach to bilingualism in California and a concern that, that many people have is that of course if it, if, if it goes here it'll go across the country because we've seen similar effects. Um, what would that be? What would you, what's the thing about this initiative well, which makes you the craziest from well, a fairness perspective? <laughs> I think two things. I think that it's untested, untried. Um, that so a nobody pilot knows program would have been that, a better that, approach. Well, something that is not an initiative. On that note, we unfortunately are out of time, which is not fair when you're dealing with such <laughs> a complicated uh, subject, but it is the way it is. So I want to thank our guests, thank Ramona you. Ripson, thank you Holly you. Thier, Jerry Annis, and Hanan Alexander. And thank all of you. Please join us next time when once again we go beyond the headlines.